Alright, thanks for watching and in a previous video, I found all the matrices such that a squared equals a. And in another video, I found all the matrices whose square is the zero matrix. Now let's do the case of all the matrices whose square is the identity matrix. And you have to understand, if a squared is the identity, it does not mean that a or is the identity or minus the identity. There are other matrices that satisfy this. For example, minus 1, 0, 0, 1. The square of this is also the identity. And just like in the previous videos, I want to explain geometrically how to find all the matrices whose square is the identity. So what I want to do, again, first of all, again, this only works for square matrices. Otherwise, A squared isn't defined. And what I want to do is find all the linear transformations whose square is what's called the identity transformation. So IV, where IV of X is just X. And surprisingly, it's very similar to uh, the case where A squared equals A. Except this time we don't use the null space, we use still the fixed point space, but also another space that I'll talk about in a second. So it turns out, here's a magic fact, we can write any V in terms of the fixed point space and, I don't know how to call it, but uh, minus the fixed point space if you want. And what is that? So F of T, again, it's the set of Y where T of Y equals Y and F minus of T it's basically the set of y where t of y reflects it, becomes minus y. So you see, you have y and then you get minus y. Sort of reflects it about the origin. And that would be an element of f minus t. And so, what we have to show by the direct sum definition, we have to show any vector can be written as the sum of those two vectors and also that the intersection of the two is non-trivial. So first of all, let's show that V is F, the sum of two vectors, one in F of T and the other one in F minus of T. And it's based on this crazy decomposition. I finally figured it out. And again, it seems to make no sense, but any X in V can be written as X over two, plus t of x over 2 plus x over 2 minus t of x over 2. Okay, and again, why? What's the motivation? I want the sum of those to be x. That's why we have x over 2 and x over 2. And technically, I wanted uh, um, t of x and minus t of x. But if you do that, you're off by a factor of 1 half. That's why you just scale it by one half and you get this. And I'm claiming that uh, this is in the fixed point space and this is in the anti-fixed point space. And the reason is, well, let's calculate t of x over two plus t of x over two. Well, that is t of x over two plus t squared of x over two. But remember, t squared is the identity. So we get t of x over 2 plus x over 2, which is x over 2 plus t of x over 2. Cool, huh? So this vector is a fixed point. t literally does nothing to this. So it is in the fixed point space. On the other hand, let's calculate this other vector. t of x over 2 minus t of x over 2 that is t of x over 2 minus t squared of x over 2. But remember, this is the identity, so this is x over 2. So this is t of x over 2 minus x over 2. And that's precisely the opposite of our vector. So minus x over 2 minus t of x over 2. So you see, t takes this vector as its input and spits out its opposite. 
So it is in the anti-fixed point space F minus. I should have called it AF. <laughs> it's anti-fixed point AF. Uh, and we just need to show that the intersection is empty. Uh, no, not empty, but the uh, zero vector. But that's not too bad. Suppose x is, a, x is in both spaces. Then on the one hand, t of x equals x. But on the other hand, t of x equals minus x. So x equals minus x, so x equals 0. So indeed, their intersection is the 0 space, and therefore we do have that v is uh, the uh, direct sum of the fixed point space and the anti-fixed point space. And what is that telling us geometrically? Let me write that down if you want. Uh, tells us as follows. So, again, I like to think of direct sums as axes. So think of the x-axis and the y-axis, except here we have the ft axis and the f minus t axis. And f minus t axis. And then, what does t do to any vector z, remember? Any vector z, you can write it in uniquely, as a vector in, as a sum of two vectors, one in x and the other one is y. So think of sort of x comma y. Then what does t do? t takes z as its input, so t of x plus y, and that is t of x plus t of y, and that becomes, again, because it's a fixed point, we have x, and because it's an anti-fixed point, we have minus y. So in other words, the way to visualize this, think of t of x, y is x comma minus y. So what t does, it literally reflects the point z on the ft axis. So if you want, this is x minus, so t of z, which is x minus z. This is, so x minus y. Because this is x and this is minus y. So it turns out all the linear transformations whose square is the identity are basically reflection about a certain axis or a certain subspace. Or, you know, the identity, which does nothing. So, uh, this is, again, a complete geometric characterization of this. And, again, we haven't used any single, uh, what's called that, any matrix calculation. How cool is that? Just with some geometry, we characterize all the, uh, I think, idempotent, no, something, t squared equals i transformations as just being all the reflections. Which is cool, because the other question, right, uh, t squared equals t, that was all the projections, and this is all the reflections. So this is neat, and I think if you want to do like t to the fourth equals i, that's even more complicated. You may have reflections, and you may have uh, rotations and stuff, but this is the one of the simple cases that we can characterize completely. Now, uh, if you want some matrices, well, here they are. So suppose we have V1 up to V, what's it called, uh, Vp is a basis for f of t, and Vp plus 1 up to Vn a basis for the anti-fixed point space, f minus of t, then because it's a direct sum, it turns out, beautiful fact, if you put those two bases together, you get a basis for v. So beta, which is v1 up to vn, is a basis. Or v, and then we can simply calculate the matrix of t with respect to that basis. And how do you do this? Remember, 
which is the matrix of T. You just evaluate T at every basis vector and write this in terms of your basis vectors. AP, VP plus one, da, 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 VF. Now, what does T do to the first P vectors? Well, it literally does nothing. T of VI is VI. And so in particular, T of V1 is V1, which is one times V1. T of V2 is V2, which is one times V2, up to VP. So on the one hand, it becomes like the identity matrix. On the other hand, for those vectors, it's just as minus it. So v, uh, Vj, it's minus Vj, which means it's the same thing, but with minus ones. Da, 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 and then zero, 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 minus one, da, 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 up to minus one. So those are up to change of bases all the matrices whose square is the identity, but in general, the answer is just with conjugation. So if you change bases, you get any P, this matrix, P inverse. And that gives you all your matrices. And again, you can maybe switch columns or something. But yes, and uh, so you see from this geometric characterization, we get this algebraic characterization. And I really think this is the essence of linear algebra, how to solve algebraic problems using geometry. Uh, all right, I hope you liked this little excursion in linear algebra. If you wanna see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.